بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين نحييكم في اليوم الثاني من المؤتمر الدولي لمستقبل التعليم العالي في الشرق الأوسط وشمال أفريقيا والمؤتمر تقوم به المنظمة العالمية للتنمية المستدامة مغرمة في لندن لكن منتشرين على طول العالم بالتعاون مع معهد الشرق الأوسط للاقتصاد المبني على المعرفة والمعهد ده والحمد لله عندنا من 2000 وبدا كان الشغل فيه من 2011 ولينا مشاركات واعضاء وجامعات من كل العالم العربي والحمد لله حتى الدول تقريبا كل الدول العربيه هسه الحمد لله عندنا مشاركات معاه كثيره والهدف من المعهد زي ما انا عرضت امبارح هو مساعده الدول العربيه في الشرق الاوسط وشمال افريقيا في انها تتحول من اقتصاد مبني على النفط والبترول أو النفط عموما الاقتصاد مبني على المعرفة والمساعدة في دعم الابتكار والإدارة المعرفة والاقتصاد المبني على المعرفة وكذلك الليدرشيب وأشياء كثيرة وده يمكن من المؤتمر الأول اللي بتقوم به أو بيقوم به المعهد أو المنظمة عن التعليم العالي في الشرق الأوسط وشمال أفريقيا I will switch to English because this is an international conference. We have delegates and speakers and participants from all over the world. I just wanted to make that short introduction in Arabic because we are talking about the Middle East and North Africa, which is a, a Arabic speaking countries. I am very pleased to welcome you all. We started yesterday and we had a tremendous, uh, fantastic, very strong start. And I'm sure today will be a continuation of what we have done yesterday. We had a great pleasure yesterday listening to different case studies from Morocco, Bahrain, Qatar, Sudan, Libya. We had also contribution from South Carolina about a very excellent session about excellence in teaching. And we were very pleased to have had two good case studies, one from South Carolina, led by Professor Mohammed Khalil, who has been voted last year as one of the best educators in medical schools. We then have a very good case study from University of Southampton, building a multi-million uh, investment uh, projects on chemical engineering. And we have seen fantastic facilities. We had lots of discussion also, case studies from Saudi Arabia and others. We will continue today our second day. And this conference is broadcasted live in our uh, all Facebook social media, the World Association for Sustainable Development, the Middle East, MENA, Africa, Sudan Knowledge, all of them is available and you can watch it. Do send us your questions through the social media. We have people who are picking those questions to our speakers. And also, uh, as I asked yesterday, kindly try to make them as short as possible and as simple as possible. And secondly, you have to appreciate, we will not be able to ask our speakers all the questions, but we will try to make priorities from here and there. We'd like to give opportunities to those who are joining us from outside, also from the Zoom. Uh, in this morning session, I have a great pleasure of having two uh, leaders in our higher education in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, yesterday, we listened to several leaders from the sector. Today, we're going to listen to two distinguished speakers. One of them is Professor Intisar Zain Sairoun. Her Excellency is the Minister of Science and Technology in Sudan. She used to be, uh, or she was, uh, she's a professor of archaeology and she was uh, the head of department at the University of Khartoum. She has a tremendous contribution in archaeological uh, studies and research. And I'm also very pleased to have with me from Cairo, uh, Professor Ihab Abdurrahman, a distinguished professor. Interestingly, one, one person yesterday said to me, uh, two major, uh, two of the key brothers you brought both of them are from physics. So we have a strong physics background and engineering. Very important because I remember a couple of years ago, I was attending a talk by a lady from Imperial College. And, she, and I didn't know that they saw uh, much gap in the, the girls, particularly, and women studying physics. So now we have two prominent uh, uh, professors in physics. He's the provost of the American University in Cairo. American University of Cairo is a well-respected uh, university across the world. Uh, we had the pleasure in 2008 or 7 to uh, they, they have contributed to a major book we have done on ICT in Africa by their department uh, and management schools. They are very well-established research entity in the whole Middle East and North Africa. So Professor Abdurrahman is joining us from Cairo. So I'm just looking for, uh, we're going to give each one of them the time to make his and her presentation or talk, and then we open it for questions. Uh, 
we're very, very much grateful for both of them. They are very busy people. As you may have heard from the vice chancellor of Southampton yesterday, he said uh, he decided to do it on Sunday because otherwise he will struggle to do it on Monday to move things. And I really appreciate also Professor uh, Abdurrahman Ofi, they have tried their best to try to fit this half an hour. I'm looking for Professor Intisar. I can't see her. Professor Intisar, I can't see you. Uh, so probably it's an internet connection. So I think we can go ahead and it's, uh, yes, Professor Intisar, you, you hear me okay? Okay, now, Professor Intisar, if you are ready, I will give you the, I, I think, you, yes, you are unmuted. Okay. It's a pleasure. I already, while you're disappearing on the internet, I welcomed you and I'm really grateful, thanking you very much. And we know very much how how uh, how valuable this uh, minutes you're going to give to us. You are very busy, person. And uh, also, uh, as I said in my introduction about you, you're a professor of archaeology at the University of Khartoum. So you're a, you're a real practitioner. Before you became the minister last year, we think you are doing a great job. You are working very hard. So the floor is yours, Professor. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, and welcome everyone there. Thank you for the chance, actually. Yeah, I need uh, such a talk from time to time. I have a very tight schedule here, very hectic days. But anyway, I'm glad that I can say something about higher education in Sudan. So I would like to start with uh, some facts about the numbers of uh, universities we are having here at uh, Sudan and the number of colleges all around the country. So we have about 34 public universities, that is government university, and we have about 16 or 17 of the private universities, and we have about uh, 89 of the private colleges. This is a very large number. Okay, when we look at it as the expansion of higher education and the need for the enrollment of more and more students, yes, it is good, it's okay. Okay, but when we come to the truth that we are suffering a lot from this expansion. The expansion started by the previous regime in 1990 and it has been expanded on schools, no infrastructure, no labs, no workshops, no lodgings or dormitories for the students and all the uh, such uh, troubles and problems. So we inherited this situation. Now in Khartoum itself, I can tell you that we are having of these 34 public university, eight of them are in Khartoum state. And from the 89 colleges, we have about 65 in Khartoum state. And from the private universities, we have about 15 of these private universities in Khartoum state. That is why the Khartoum is now crowded, and you can imagine we are having about five, 500,000 students room in Khartoum from Sunday or Monday, from Sunday up to Friday. And with this statistics, I believe that the governor of the state would, 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 would be amazed to, to, to understand that he is he's, he's facing a real problem of transportation a problem of, uh, of uh, feeding all these students, the problem of the lodging for these students. Now, when we, when we came to, to this, for us here at uh, the Ministry of Higher Education, we are faced with this uh, situation and we are very doubtful that the Sudan can achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals without having a very strong higher education system. We know that the contribution of, of the higher education is, uh, is uh, crucial, in particular for achieving real progress uh, in basic and secondary education. Now, for higher education, support, of course, the rest of the education system through the training of effective teachers, uh, through um, school principals, the involvement of highly qualified specialists in curriculum development, and of course, educational research, and the design of appropriate test to assess students' learning outcomes. Now, again, is this background and what I have just told you, primary objective of our policy is, is, is to provide the diagnosis of the current performance of Sudan higher education system and institutions and propose a range of uh, options that the Minister of Higher Education and Scientific Research can consider for a sort of uh, let us say, revitalizing and developing the subsector. 
What I would like to say now is that we need to talk about the current performance of the Sudanese higher education system. We have, um, for example, if I want to talk about educational attainment and equity, at 2%, the proportions of adults in the working age populations, that is to say 25 plus, who have completed the higher education degree is, is still very low. Now, Sudan's higher education attainment lacks really, really lacks behind almost all of the benchmarking countries with the exception of South Africa. Sudan has a good gender balance in access to higher education with 50% of enrollments being female. However, the distribution of enrollment of female students is uneven across the disciplines. Um, I'll give you an example, for example, uh, Women uh, are underrepresented in engineering and informatics, constituting only 25.8% and 45% uh, respectively. Now, again, some things which I just mentioned that in the introduction is that this higher education displays acute geographic inequalities as admission into universities by according to the population in different regions and the states in the Sudan. It is not a proportion. The proportion of students is less than 3 per thousand of population in Eastern region, for example, in Kordofan, in Darfur, while it is greater than 5 per thousand, uh, per thousand in, in Khartoum and in Central region and in the Nazar region. One of the important things about the current performance is the problem of quality and relevance. Okay, here in the absence of uh, objective measure for of quality, which now we, 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 we have already uh, sent our, uh, our uh, statute for, uh, for, for, for reform, and uh, we hope that in, in a month's time we will get the results anyway. But, uh, until this moment, there is an absence of objective measures of quality. The global university ranking, can be used as a useful proxy to assess the quality of higher education in Sudan from international perspective. No Sudanese university makes it into the list of top 1,000 institutions of the four major rankings of higher education institutions in the world. And even regionally, you have just the University of Heart, the universities in, in web metrics, in, yes, ranking. It is 34 position in the Arab region and 37 um, I think position in Africa. Now, globally, the University of Khartoum, the example I'm giving here, is ranked at 1994 by web metrics. Unemployment, of course, is uh, one of the problems here, and 25% of the unemployed youth are university graduates. When I move to another point in the current performance, uh, research and technology transfer research and technology transfer, the quantitative scientific production of Sudan is relatively lower than uh, SSA countries like Ethiopia, Kenya, and South Africa, and much lower than Arab and East Asian nations like in Egypt, Jordan, and Malaysia. From the perspective of quality and the impact of the scientific output, Sudan high index is significantly low. Now, to explain the performance of, of higher education, uh, I mentioned already that we had the expansion policies, which happened uh, following the uh, liberalization of Sudan economy in early 1990s and the reduction in public subsidies in 2011, that we have private provision of higher education has increased rapidly from 10 to 15% of total enrollment between 2000 up to 2014. At the same time, the public universities have been set up in each state over the past decades for political representation reason, of course. So we have, are having all these universities without any infrastructure. Now, at the admission itself to undergraduate degree program in Sudan is based on the result of the school certification examination taken at the end of secondary school. The students then are placed in programs, which is um, uh, controlled by the Ministry of Higher Education. And of course, uh, they are uh, selected uh, on their exam scores. However, since 1997, parallel admissions, and this is one of the main issues that we are trying to, to reform. There is a parallel admissions that have been introduced to raise the revenues of public universities. This is how 
the public universities were just forced to Uh, to have this parallel admission and uh, and uh, just to get money because they need money to for for their infrastructure. Now, uh, of course, this is uh, shows um, there is no justice in this and there is inequity because if you are rich, then you can't get your your child to to the university, uh, paying money, and then the other who scored the same degree would not have uh, a chance to do that because he's a poor. Another issue is the quality and relevance. There is a significant this match between the training and the skills that colleges and universities provide and between the needs of the labor market in, uh, in Sudan. And this is of course reflected in the large disparity between distribution of graduates and the composition of jobs in the Sudanese labor market. Uh, for example, we have among the BA degree students, 84% graduate with humanities education, health, services or social sciences degrees. Now only nine and five percent of PhD of uh, bachelors and uh, diploma graduates respectively is specialized in agriculture, which is the largest employment sector in the country. It takes about 80 percent. Now uh, this is uh, one of, of, the, of the issues that I would like. Another proxy for measuring the quality is the student teacher ratio. Again, um, which provides an indirect estimate for the amount of contact time between the students and their professors. Now, Sudan's students uh, to teacher ratio for higher education, at some places it reached about 48, which is significantly higher than all benchmarking countries, including Kenya, which is 33.8, and Ethiopia 31.22. This high ratio could imply a considerable strain, of course, on the quality of teaching itself and learning at the higher education level in, in, in Sudan. Now, connected to this point, again, there is um, this um, uh, teacher qualifications, of course, are also an issue, and, and, and uh, there has been a growing demand for academic staff due to the rise in enrollments. This is, of course, made by part-time work of academic staff. We, we know that many of the of the, of the teachers, of the professors left the country to the Gulf countries because of the economic of course situation. And um, most of the qualified actually academics, they went to Gulf countries and to Europe and other areas over the past two decades. Uh, coming to the uh, research and technology transfer. Now we lack, at, when, we, when it came to this position, we, we discovered that we do not have a national scientific research and innovation strategy to guide the efforts of the universities in this area. Of special concern uh, is the fact that even though agriculture, for example, remains the main sector in the, in, in the economy, the country does not have a research strategy and program focusing, for example, on desertification or in uh, renewable energy, water resources, the important things nowadays. Now, many elements of the dysfunction outlined yeah, and, uh, and in the in the in the, uh, the the issue of 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 quality, have of course an adverse impact on research capacity and the output. The high student teacher ratio and the low proportion of academics with PhD translate into high teaching loads, little time for research, of course, and poor years to complete the studies. Uh, uh, yes, and, and poor um, uh, academic, uh, uh, poor supervision. Sorry, poor supervision of. Uh, of graduate students. Uh, this is one of the problems of supervision for, for master and for PhD. Uh, and a good example is the oldest and most prestigious university in the country, that is the University of Khartoum, which had good research capacity in its early years. Many research groups have stopped their investigations for lack of resources. Now since of course it will start changing. Now for the governance and management, the Sudanese universities face a number of uh, uh, governance challenges as the system has become entirely politicized under the previous regime. But since the uh, 2019 revolution and as part of the political transition, the government now has been working on establishing an adequate governance framework and proposing new rules to define how the sector is guided, supervised and managed in a transparent way. Uh, in a transparent manner. And of course, this of course requires considering many issues, which I don't I will have time to talk about. Um, maybe if um, there's a section for, for questions, uh, I can get some of these uh, issues. 
Now for financing, recent data on resources mobilization for higher education are lacking, of course. Statistics from 2014, it shows that public spending for that level represented only 0.2 of the GDP, which is extremely low and uh, way below the average in Sub-Saharan Africa, so that is 0.8%. And of course, we managed that just uh, this year now uh, for the budget for the higher education to move it to move it uh, to uh, 1%. Higher education institutions are authorized to charge tuition fees and have production units to revenue generating activities which enable them to compensate partly for the low government budget contribution. Resulted in what the staff salaries are very low compared to other qualified jobs in the private sector. Has resulted in large share of briefcase professors, actually what you call them briefcase professors, who teach multiple universities at the same time, including private ones, in order to earn salaries that is sufficient to sustain them. Again, this is one of the help in, in this uh, case of refresh the higher education or to form a, a higher education in, in Sudan. We, 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 we need, of course, to define, to define a vision for the future, which we have already done. And we have put a strategic plan of higher education and scientific research for 2021 up to 2025. And this has been guided by, by the form of higher education and scientific research in Sudan. Uh, 2020 policies. We have many to do that by uh, the Minister of Higher Education Scientific Research together in collaboration with the World Bank. And also, um, this was based on recommendation of the strategic plan workshop organized by the Minister has been held by situation analysis, which is um, evaluated using the information from universities and annual reports and report on non-governmental education institutions 2020. We have been doing this uh, in the last year, despite the COVID, despite the, uh, all other uh, problems and diseases that happened after the floods of the Sudan. But we have been uh, at the ministry. Uh, there are few of our employees here who were really who work very hard to, to we started reviewing the admission and registration department and, and data, which has been also verified. So from all this data, we, we managed to create uh, and to put and to define our vision for, for the higher education and to put the strategic priority area. So this is the very thing which we have put in. Now we are thinking of increasing access and equity. This is very important. And how we are thinking of how can we have a diversif diversification of, of higher education programs, uh, mainly are depending on, on this um, academic uh, you know, uh, education that is studying medicine, is studying economics, studying archaeology, studying history, and all these things, engineering. But now we are thinking of, of, the, um, of uh, uh, higher education in, in, in technology. And we are, we are thinking of having some research universities. Uh, when you have a variety of, of programs, then you can increase access and, 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 and the equity as well. Now, uh, we have, uh, again, uh, effective, very effective equity uh, promotion uh, policy, which involves, of course, two approach combining uh, the financial support to eliminate the main problem, that is the monetary barriers and non-monetary measures to overcome the academic, motivational, psychological barriers uh, that the students from underrepresented groups may face is one of the issues and now we are faced with um, after the peace um, agreement uh, signature in Juba uh, where now we will be having more and more of the students who should be accepted at different universities so uh, this uh, issue of diversification of higher education diplomas and the community colleges will help a lot in this issue and uh, the other thing is to improve of course quality and relevance and uh, uh, we need to to have a, a sort of uh, uh, measures to bring about improved quality and to raise student learning outcomes 
and to increase also the relevance of the programs like, for example, curricula. I think uh, what Professor Tisar, do you hear us okay? I think maybe we, uh, I think she's trying to come from her phone now. Uh, please, uh, the, the message I receive is that the host is unmuted everyone. So I couldn't unmute myself. Yeah, yeah, we're hearing you. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay, I'm moving now to another part of the office. Uh, now, okay. Modern, now about, uh, about uh, scientific research, we, we think that it's important to improve gender equity and uh, the university leadership teams ought to put in place uh, special programs to attract uh, more qualified female academics into research. So combining financial and non-monetary measures to remove existing obstacles as far as scientific research is concerned. Now the leading Sudanese universities must also strengthen their research and development activities uh, to be able to engage with the local economy as one of the key pillars of the country's revitalization strategy. Uh, now, the last point I think uh, before concluding is uh, modernizing governance and management. And uh, the Minister of Higher Education recognized that efforts to improve the quality of teaching and learning and raise the research output in Sudanese universities. And all these are unlikely to succeed, of course, without uh, modernization of governance structures and process. Now for this purpose, universities need more freedom and flexibility to develop transformational vision and solid strategic plan to implement that vision. The Sudanese government could focus on outlining the rules of engagement with well-defined distinction between the responsibilities of the state and rights and obligations of higher education institutions. So we have, we really need to move uh, towards a supervisory role for the Minister of Higher Education. More empowered university councils, this is important. And the appointment of university leaders through a transparent selection process. This is based of course on professional criteria and on very clear rules of uh, engagement for increased autonomy and accountability. These are really after uh, very important. After three decades of undue political interference in the life of the universities, now the Sudanese uh, higher education system could benefit from an enhanced role of the Minister of Higher Education as a steward. Now, the last point is designing and implementing um, a sustainable financing strategy. So in terms of resources mobilization, uh, putting into consideration, of course, uh, the competing demands for public funding yeah, and the limited uh, resources of the Sudanese government in transition period. It is unlikely that the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research uh, would receive a greater share of the national budget. Actually, we, we really, we, 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 we fought uh, a very fierce fight in the last uh, December to get more money for higher education. Now, therefore, to promote further resource mobilization, we have three avenues. Either to allow the public universities to raise tuition fees, or to encourage them to diversify their source of income. And this is where, this second point, we really uh, encourage it very much. And the third thing is to promote public and private partnerships with which the PPPs, which you already, we have already started doing that. 
we are having now four of these universities, uh, uh, private universities uh, have these uh, relations with uh, public universities, beside, of course, uh, other private sectors. One of the main issues that comes uh, very clear, the, the COVID-19 crisis. Now, uh, uh, we, which really has a very negative impact on the higher education. And we are having a real problem concerning the online and the distant learning. But uh, we already, again, started also trying to, to help some of the universities who lack uh, the infrastructure and the needed platforms for such an education. Uh, but for uh, some, some of the university, of course, many to, to, to get through the, the, the COVID-19 crisis. And, and when I say some of the universities, I mean the, the, the public universities. Because the private universities, most of them have the necessary equipment for the education. Now, uh, just to conclude, uh, as the government of Sudan uh, now seeks to, to revitalize, to refresh uh, the higher education, it needs to take uh, four elements into careful consideration. That is number one, how to use the window of opportunity offered by the transition situation to make important reform decisions for the future. This is very important. And the second thing is what planning and management tools must be put in place to facilitate decision making. What would be adequate? Uh, sequencing of interventions in the short and the medium terms. And uh, the last one is how to, to leverage the potential contribution of donors through close coordination and rallying, of course, around the government development priorities for higher education. And now uh, for this last point, we are having about 700 million USD dollars uh, from which uh, we, we, we managed to secure 50 million for the infrastructure for the labs at the different, uh, different uh, universities in the regions. Thank you very much. I think this is enough. I will leave the rest for the questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Intisar. And uh, we really appreciate uh, you're doing everything you can to join us. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have questions, yes, uh, but uh, as we agreed, I will, uh, but we are, we are grateful you tried your best. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll keep the questions to until we listen to the second speaker. Uh, I would like now to move to our second speaker, uh, our second keynote speaker, Professor Rehab Abdurrahman. He is the provost of the university, the American University uh, in Cairo. Uh, he's a well-respected academics uh, across the world. He studied in Utah in the United States. He's uh, from the School of uh, Physics. His contribution as an academic, as a researcher, and as a leader in higher education is well established. And I think also the university, as we said earlier, is one of the best uh, leading universities in the region. With an example in the West here, we always see the American University in Cairo. So professor, the floor is yours. Uh, I think you can just unmute yourself and uh, you are sharing already, I can see. Yes, um, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. And uh, before I start, I would like to thank the organizing committee and the organizers of the conference for their kind invitation and for taking all the effort to bring us together uh, today. Uh, good uh, morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is the beauty or the opportunity that comes with the challenge of COVID-19 that they can bring us from all over the world, from different time zones to be uh, in the same room to talk about issues together. I'm uh, delighted to participate and take part of the World Association for Sustainable Development Virtual Conference, the conference that hosts participants from all over the world. And my great, it is my great honor uh, today to uh, uh, a wide range of, to, uh, to speak to a wide range of academicians, practitioners, policymakers, researchers, leaders, and managers from public and private sectors. I'm really honored to be uh, the speaker in the same session with Her Excellency Professor Intisar El-Zain 
Uh, thank you, Professor Insar, for your insights about Sudan. This is, I think Sudan is not uh, unique in that situation. Many, many countries are uh, actually in the same pool with Sudan uh, when it comes to how to advance and help higher education to deliver their uh, mission to help the sustainable development of the country. Throughout my presentation today, I'm aiming to share experiences and hoping to create partnership, uh, partnerships to enhance knowledge sharing and the international cooperation between all of us. Uh, to promote the exchange of knowledge, experiences, and information and ideas related to uh, sustainable world development is our responsibility as educational leaders and scholars. Before I restart, let me actually give you uh, an introduction about the American University in Cairo. Uh, we uh, were founded in 1919, so our uh, now we're uh, 102 years old. We just celebrated our uh, 100th anniversary a couple of years ago, and we are a premier English language in private institution, and I would add also not-for-profit institution in Egypt committed to teaching and research. Uh, the QS ranking lists us as one of the top universities in the world. AUC offers ex ex exceptional liberal arts uh, education, and that's what we pride ourselves with: is the liberal arts education, our uh, uh, educate and our uh, teaching philosophy. And I want to actually relate that later on to the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Our inquiry-based learning strategy focus on critical thinking, creativity, communication, and collaboration. In fall 2020, uh, our campus had uh, around 700 full-time equivalent faculty with almost 50% of them are international faculty. Our faculty to student ratio um, is uh, one to 10 in this fall, uh, last fall. AUC has international prestige a uh, prestigious partnership with almost 260 partner universities all over the world, uh, many of them actually in, uh, in, uh, in North America. And we welcome students from all from around 50 countries. So on our campus, not now, but on our student body, we have almost uh, 50 nationalities uh, representing all of our students. Um, we build culture of leadership, lifelong learning and service among our graduates with our dedication to make significant contribution to Egypt and the international community in diverse fields. Our alumni uh, are shining around the globe with uh, actually, and they are located in more than 128 countries, uh, ha handling prominent business, diplomacy, government position. Uh, they always make us uh, proud, uh, proud of AUC and of our achievement through them. Um, so uh, let me actually move uh, to the next uh, slide and talk about the future of operation strategy for education in Egypt. Uh, and I'm not authorized to talk about Egypt, but this is what Egypt has announced in its vision of 2030. So I'm giving just highlights from Egypt to uh, vision 2030. Uh, our future of operation strategy of education in Egypt is to meet the sustainable millennium and to develop, a goal, to develop goals and to achieve the fourth goal of the United Nations uh, Convention on Sustainable Development. Education for sustainability is an essential component of our changing world. The term used to describe the types of education for sustainability is diverse, including environmental education, education for durability, education for sustainable development. In Egypt, we emphasize the education, uh, uh, that education plays an essential role in breaking the, inter, uh, the intergenerational cycle of poverty, increasing the earning potential and improved health uh, outcomes, psychological well-being and personal sense of social existence. In that regard, the social pillar uh, of Vision 2030 in the uh, Arab Republic of Egypt aims to create a fair and just society. Education plays a leading role in developing the skills and knowledge for all uh, Egyptians to achieve the aspiration of the Vision 2030 and the 2014 Constitution of Egypt that education is a fundamental right for all citizens and the state is obliged to provide it. Um, 
how EUC is working towards achieving this goal? How can we contribute to the country vision of 2030? In EUC, we are serious about building education system capable of preparing young people for knowledge societies in the future. Uh, we enhance new ways uh, 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 that focus more on procedural knowledge and awareness of cognitive process. We hope that we are leading the country in that demand. We hope that we actually lead by example at, uh, in Egypt. And actually we teach our, uh, or not our, or we didn't say teach, but we help our sister universities in Egypt to, uh, 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 in, in that goal. Uh, so at, directly we have established many initiatives at EUC that help the sustainable uh, uh, development of the country. So for example, in September 2011, we established the Office, office, of, sustainable, uh, uh, office of Sustainability. The main objective of that office is to integrate environmental and societal sustainability into the university culture and structure and our curriculum too. The Office of Sustainability at the American University in Cairo uh, released the university inaugural sustainable report. We issue that report every other year. And actually uh, that helps us also to uh, ensure the, uh, sustainable, uh, uh, the sustainability of our campus and also to measure our carbon footprint on the campus, something that we are proud of. Not only that, we also uh, aspire to help our sister universities in Egypt to establish the same offices and help them to uh, develop their own carbon footprint for each university. The carbon footprint for our university helps us actually uh, to focus on how uh, uh, can we contribute to society at large and teach our students through that office uh, many aspects of sustainable development. We also have established the Master of Science in Sustainable Development and the beauty of that Master of Science in Sustainable Development that actually it works across all schools in EUC. So it works in the School of Business, science of engineering, global affairs and public policy, and humanities and, and social science. And the, it accepts students from all disciplines and it insists actually to educate students in all aspects of sustainable development. So an engineering student should actually work closely with public, uh, with, with global affairs and public policy uh, uh, school and humanities and social sciences and business in order to ensure that his idea that he's contributing to the society is accepted uh, from the business side and also contributes to uh, the society at large. Uh, sometimes when we find, and as an engineering, uh, as an engineer, when, sometimes when we do a solution, we don't look at the impact of that solution on the society. This is part of that master's degree and we're proud of that. We also have the Center of Applied Research on Environmental Sus uh, Sustainability, CARES, and CARES envision a region of modern, sustainable, and uh, prosperous communities. CARES' mission is to guide sustainable development efforts in Egypt, the region, and beyond by providing holistic academic programs and applied interdisciplinary research of improving lives and life, hold, life, holds, life holds, while actually safeguarding natural resources and future generation, uh, generations to come. But more importantly and indirectly, uh, our liberal education philosophy encourages our students to think critically and examine the role in the world. AUC students are more engaged in the world economics, politics, and cultural traditions, and they can analytically find creative solutions to enduring and, uh, and urgent problems while ensuring the sustainability development of the society. We ask our students to be uh, educated in all aspects. We ask our students to be well-rounded citizens and that actually contributes to the sustainable development of our world. And I think liberal education, the liberal education philosophy at EUC helps the universities, our university and our graduates to uh, help the community uh, uh, at large. Um, uh, uh, the, what is the impact of COVID-19 uh, pandemic lockdown on the future of role of higher education? And I wanna actually go quickly over that too. Uh, well, there is a digital advantage. Uh, the, uh, uh, the new education reliance on digital solution during COVID-19. And uh, this is gonna change the way uh, the higher education will serve the communities in the future, the COVID-19 crisis. 
has brought uh, has brought uh, has brought uh, about years of a change in how educational institutions in all sectors and regions do their business. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced restructuring in the education sector to ensure delivery of service is accomplished to the greatest possible extent in Asia. Education institutions have had to adapt to the situation quickly. This has resulted in an unprecedented push to online learning. Actually, many institutions are looking at offering fully online degrees now in the country and, uh, and looking at how can we actually uh, uh, do this without while engaging the students also in the education process. EC has handled COVID-19 actually in, uh, in a very good way, in my own opinion. We started early, we started to prepare be, before even uh, COVID-19 comes to Egypt. Once we heard that the, the issue is in uh, China, we, uh, senior administration said it's a matter of time uh, to actually uh, uh, to come to Egypt. So we started to prepare early. So we actually um, established a special corona, a coronavirus task force to review university uh, uh, um, uh, readiness and act as a focal point of contact for sharing timely, accurate, relevant information with AUC community. We, in, on, the, on, on the education side, uh, our, our priority were given to the health and safety of all, all of our AUC faculty and students. But at the same time, we moved quickly to ensure that everyone is equipped to be taught and teach online. Um, uh, so looking at the future, uh, what will be the, the future? Part of uh, COVID-19 impact at EUC that uh, we once uh, we COVID-19 actually hit Egypt, we started to uh, think quickly, what will the future look like? And I established a committee from uh, a really leading faculty members at EUC who are known to be innovative and creative to look at the future and uh, that committee has created a report to us to uh, propose to us what are the changes needed at EUC and in the country in order to uh, adapt to the changes that COVID-19 has uh, 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 mandated on all of us. And um, um, so we must consider technology. This is part of the recommendation of that committee that we must consider technology as a tool for education and social development. COVID-19 presents education and learning with a unique challenge, but as we all know with a challenge, there are many, many opportunities. Um, um, right now, our main task is to work hard to achieve the best education quality that serves education for sustainability in the essential components. Together, we have an immense responsibility in shaping the future of our education as in education leaders. EUC is looking forward to continuing cooperation with all academician uh, practitioners for having a bright uh, future for the country and uh, for the world at large. Um, what will the future look like? We don't really know, but we know it's not going to be what we have today. Uh, we know that 10 years from today, uh, the higher education system in all countries will be changing. Uh, 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 online uh, education will be part of it. Uh, faculty being in a classroom teaching to the students is not going to be the only modality of teaching from now on. So what do we need to uh, be prepared for that a lot? One of the things that we need to work on, especially in Egypt and other countries in the same situation like Egypt, is the internet uh, or the, on, uh, the internet infrastructure in the, in the country. This is something, it's a must now that we need to address uh, immediately. And uh, with that, I will stop and uh, I will leave the rest for uh, Q's and A's. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, ve thank you very much, Professor. That's very enlightening and excellent presentation. Uh, if you can kindly stop the share, yes. Thank you very much, Professor. I, uh, uh, very, very exciting, and I'm very pleased to see that presentation. And I really like that CARES. It's really nice title for that master program. Really, uh, one of the things we were looking for all Middle Eastern countries to try to work with them really in partnership in terms of master in science and sustainable development. And I'm very pleased to see that something you did there. Now, uh, I would like to open for question. I know there's many questions. Uh, I have many questions came to me inside the Zoom. If you would like to ask a question, please use uh, 
the hand uh, on reaction so I can know you want to ask a question and then I will give you the chance. Uh, I'll start from, there's lots of questions really, even from yesterday we had questions, but let me just go quickly with the first question. Professor Intisar, one of the questions is, is there's lots of them, but I think to summarize it, uh, we are not doing very well in higher education and they said we are out of the, of the Middle East ranking or top leads universities or in the whole ranking. So it's more of Sudan is not doing very well in higher education across the region. I know you mentioned statistic early and you mentioned we are 37 out of in Africa. I mean, can you hear me, Professor Ntisar? Okay, so I will, maybe I will ask Professor. Uh, yes, I can, yes, I hear you. Yes, yeah. so the first question, Professor, for you is, we are not doing very well, of course. You took the ministry only last year and there are very difficult circumstances. No one can disagree with that. But uh, people, they are so keen of seeing a fast, quick change. And they see that we are, they said uh, in Arabic, they said, how do you respond to that, Professor? Are we really out of the map in higher education in the Middle East? Not that much because um, if you look to our graduates and to expatriates from the university, you know that the University of Khartoum and the other big universities have graduated uh, uh, many people who, who went there and work at the Gulf countries and who are now in Europe and in the Americas. That shows the quality of education itself is okay. But we are having now, but the, there is a, actually a, uh, there is a degradation, if I may say, uh, there is a decline, of course, because most of these people just left the country. Most of, if I give you the, the statistics of who is teaching at the universities. Okay, Professor uh, Abdurrahman, let me ask you a question and then we'll see how Tisar will get back. Uh, of course, I'm not here to, to, uh, to, to, com to commentary on your, uh, Professor Tisar, can you just carry on? Can you, Professor, continue? Unmute yourself, Professor. You need to unmute yourself. I have, no, I have Ferris. I, somebody have to do it there because I have tried many times to unmute okay, no myself. Problem. Like no, no, it's fine. Now, yeah. yes, now, now the host uh, has allowed me to unmute <laughs> myself. Anyway, I believe that, <laughs> yes. You remember when you were trying to, to tell me to unmute yourself, unmute yourself. I was trying, I was pressing hard on the bottom, but no way because the host <laughs> okay, is not no allowed. Music so, so you feel, anyway, uh, uh, you said, you said the, the situation, situation is not as bad yes, as I, people are saying. No, no, no. It is that the situation also will improve. Now we are having, uh, at least the salaries are increased and uh, uh, we are having more people helping from outside the country. Now we are having... Uh, the, 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 uh, the distant learning platform at the Ministry of Higher Education, which is with all its branches at different universities in the uh, Western uh, Darfur and Kordofan and even in the Northern Sudan. And now we're having more people who are, yeah, I mean, who donated, just, who just want to, to teach even from, from distant, uh, all the Sudanese who are working abroad, who are uh, in Egypt or in, or in uh, Gulf countries or in Europe or wherever, they all want to help. That is one thing. The other thing is that why we are not in the rank. We are having other problems. You know, the ranking is not depending only on, on what you teach, because what we taught for the people, it shows itself in the people who are working outside the country. It is also has something to do with our appearance in the internet. Of course, there is electricity shortage from time to time. It depends on how people publish their papers. Most of our scholars are publishing their papers from other universities. In the, in the Arab countries and in other universities. So this is, this is won't be shown up, of course, here for, for, uh, for the ranking. So we are having other problems that, that might have, I yeah, mean, might uh, lead to, to, to the situation that we are not very clear or visible in the, uh, for the ranking. Besides the problem of the electricity, I told you and, and, and all these issues. So this is uh, uh, one thing which we are trying to, to solve now, and this is, I'm, I'm sure that the, the things will, will get better and better as soon as the economy is stable in the country. Okay, Professor, I, since I, the internet is getting better now, another question is triggering in the Facebook quite a lot, really. 
what is the issue with this? Uh, uh, because yesterday when we had like Professor Muhammad Khalil talking about the excellence in higher education, one of them is a teacher, he said. He called it like this teacher. So the teacher, enabling teacher, training the teacher, which is a lecture he's referring to. But when you compare that to Sudan about the salaries, exactly in a very short summary, I know it's a big political debate going on in Sudan, but exactly what are the teacher, are the, our, our academic staff in Sudan, are they, um, what is it, what, are they not getting salary at all? Because if, if you are the minister, you can give the correct answer here. What is going on with the salaries of staff at universities in Sudan? Uh, you mean this month? Yes, or either they are before. not getting salary or what is the problem? No, no, no. The problem is that, you know, after the, 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 the December in January, most of the financial things wouldn't go the same, of course, uh, as, as before. And uh, for so for January, we just have to wait. And uh, when we got the money, we got it very late or early, no, early in uh, February. And um, uh, we gave them the money that is, um, it's a, a sort of uh, support. It is not the salaries. The universities are independent. What they got from the Ministry of Finance is just some money as a support for the higher education. So um, it is not enough in some cases for the, for the salaries of the staff and for the employees. But in many of the universities, that, that money which has been distributed through the Ministry of Higher Education was enough. Now we are trying to, to fix this and uh, no, we have been trying to fix this for the last few days. And today we managed to, to finish uh, the issue we, and we hope that won't be repeated for the next month. Okay, uh, stay with me. We have lots of questions. And I think uh, Professor Joseph, I got your question, but I will, uh, if you can I, just I, hold on. If I can, uh, if I can, I have been looking to the, what has been uh, texted on the, yeah, you can. Yes. Okay, address. And I have uh, Professor Joseph. Has... Okay, Professor Joseph Nata, you have a question. Go ahead, Professor, from uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Business from uh, Makariri University, Uganda. Go ahead, Professor. Just unmute yourself, Professor. Hello. Yes, okay. go ahead. Hello. Okay. I thank you, uh, Professor Insta, uh, for your presentation. And I have uh, <clears throat> around two questions. Um, you did say that 65% uh, uh, of the unemployed youth uh, are university graduates. And uh, I know that Sudan has been going through a number of challenges uh, over the last few years. Am I right to attribute the massive unemployment among the young people and the graduates to the economic crisis that the country has been going through in the last decades and uh, to the former regime's educational uh, and uh, employment policies, uh, which are based on empowerment? And how is Sudan actually dealing with this kind of problem or challenge at the moment? Okay, then uh, to check the, the, the numbers, uh, unemployment among the youth in Sudan is at 27, 27%. And Sudanese economist estimate, yes, it is 27. And the Sudanese uh, uh, economist estimate that 25% of this 27 uh, are university graduates. That is uh, what I said. Yes, of course, the economic situation is definitely part of this, but again, uh, the, the university's policies before and the Minister of Higher Education policy of, of, uh, of uh, enrollment and of expansion of, of the education without studying what is needed for the Sudan. You know, many of these graduates who graduated from the faculties of medicine or nursery or engineering, they will just find their way to the Gulf countries. The rest, they are the rest who are, who are, who are staying here, who are staying in Sudan. But uh, the economic situation, yes, you are absolutely right. That is one of the main things about it. But uh, we believe our, we believe that we need to change the policy of the enrollment. We need to change the, the, the issue of, of having just academic, you know, having just faculty of medicine, faculty of nursery, faculty of agriculture. No, we need, we need, we need the technology more, more and more for the technological study. Is and um, we, we would like more to have a diploma, three years diploma, and we would like to have more of the community uh, colleges 
which is very important for the coming uh, period as we are going to see many people coming back from the from the camps, uh, people who are coming from the fights and all these people, they need really training. And I believe that with this, we can create more and more jobs for a lot of people in the country. So this might help in decreasing the, the unemployment. Okay, so thank you very much. Let me just stay with us, Professor Tisar. Let me ask Professor uh, Abdurrahman, there's a couple of questions here. Professor, uh, American University in Cairo is well respected, it's a prestigious university, and many people, they see it as a modern university. When we talk in the West about modern, and, and we have seen that in your presentation, you are tackling the big issues. Two questions actually rating. What is your uh, one, two, three list of the key success factor? I mean, if I can call the AUC as a successful university in the region, this is with how the West see it, is a, a very successful university. Your graduates, which normally one of the best measurement of the university, we know we know many, any, even in our advisory board, we have people who are graduate of your university. I, I believe Professor Ntisar also, she got one of her degrees from the AUC. So you definitely have a good record of graduates with good quality, no question. Can I ask you, what is the success factors for the AUC being in the heart of the Middle East? Uh, not the question as why you are successful, but what can you advise as a roadmap for other universities? Because we know higher education institution in the Middle East are not really ranking high overall in the whole world. But your university is doing well by whatever standard that might mean in terms of research. You are very good in terms of research and academic. And the second question is actually from yesterday, and I promised to bring it over to you today. The global ranking now, uh, big universities, all the one like Cairo University, Khartoum University, big names are not in very high level in the Middle East as in the least global ranking like new one. If you compare Qatar University with all due respect, it's a very good university, but it's not as old as Khartoum or Cairo University. But if you look to the global ranking by the time, sire, uh, Qatar University is very high. The same for uh, United Arab Emirates University. So what is the reason big old universities, Cairo, Kuwait University, Khartoum University are not in high level compared to new university? And the second one or the first one is, what is your uh, key success factor you can share with us? Oh, thank you very much. I think I will, uh, those are very important questions. I really like the, the first question about what are the success key success factors that we look at when we uh, assess our performance in the university. Actually, two things that we uh, really um, put emphasis on internally at the university. One are our graduates uh, going out to the job market after they graduate and creating jobs or not. We are not looking at our, uh, as, as them, are they getting jobs or not? This is not what we want them to do. I don't want to prepare my student to get a job after he or she graduates. I want them to create jobs after he or she graduates. Uh, so that's uh, that's one, one key success factor for our uh, university. Second is, are we preparing them for their last job, not for the first job? Uh, so that means, are, are we educating them to continue to be long, uh, 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 life uh, learners in the future. Those are two success factors and how many of them change job, jobs. This is also important to us. If someone stays in his or her job forever, that's not what we want our uh, graduates to be. So those are the things that we measure our success at the university uh, uh, in Egypt. Uh, I'm not going to talk about research. Research is a different area that we it can be addressed later on, but uh, I think education is the key mission of any university, and that's what I'm focusing on uh, here uh, today. Ranking. Um, uh, to me, and I will be very blunt and honest, ranking is a game. If you choose to play it, you have to play it without really affecting uh, your vision and the mission of your university. So uh, you, I, as a provost, take the rankings uh, with a great, a, a great, a big grain of salt. Uh, we choose to focus on two rankings: Times Higher Education and QS ranking, mainly because they they, they address the mission of our university more than any other ranking. We're not, and I'll, I'll say that bluntly, we are not a research university. We're not a R R one university. 
we, uh, we aspire to do more research, but our main focus is uh, teaching, undergraduate teaching and graduate students who are able to create jobs in the country and in the region to contribute to the economics of the country and the region. So for ranking, uh, my advice to all universities is uh, if you decide to play the game uh, and sometimes the pressure from parents and students uh, pushes you to play that game, uh, please play it without uh, losing focus on your mission and your vision for your own university. Okay, Professor, I'm going to go to the, the question I'm taking to Professor Tisar, but maybe I can ask you to start on that question before I move to a language. Uh, the question is for Professor Tisar, which I would like you to start answering it about uh, some people are, I think there's three, three, four comments here. When are we going to see back to English in universities in Sudan teaching? So given that American University in Cairo teach in English, do you see teaching in English is one of the key success factor for uh, a university in the 21st century to reconnect with the discourse of the global sustainable development uh, agenda? Or do you think we stick to our Arabic language, for example, or like in Germany, they teach in Germany. If you go to Finland, they teach in their language. And uh, I personally, I have traveled, I met many deans, even in our advisory board. If you ask this question to one professor like you in Germany or in France or in Finland, he will say to you, yeah, why do I don't teach with my language? But then people in Sudan now are in other countries, they say we have to teach in English. What is your perspective on this professor? Before I go to Professor Intisar. Oh, okay, so I actually, uh, uh, okay. Um, I think we were in the same situation after the 2011 uh, uh, revolution of discussing what should should we teach English in Egypt more? Should we prepare our students for uh, more interaction with the world? Uh, I, I would say actually, uh, as long as we are in the Arab region, still are not producing knowledge. And I believe that most of the knowledge is produced out of our region now. We need, and we are more consumer of knowledge. We need to actually uh, teach our students to other languages in order to make sure that they understand those uh, knowledge. Uh, as a parent, uh, and uh, actually I uh, push my own sons to uh, learn more than one language in order to, be, be, to, to make them able to communicate with many people as possible because now, with the internet, with the, this open society now, uh, our kids should be able to communicate with other cultures uh, in their own languages, by the way, in order to understand them. And that's actually prepared them for the future. So teaching other languages, not only English, is very important for the younger generation. And actually, yes, we should uh, uh, in encourage teaching English, French, as well as Arabic, by the way, the Arabic language in our region has been, the teaching of Arabic language in our region has been declining. And we need yeah. to face that too. Uh, you know, many of the private you know, school students do not really write or speak Arabic really well. So we need to focus on teaching Arabic as well. Okay. I hope I answered my question, your question. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Professor Intisar, the question uh, about language, which was uh, originally yes. addressed to you. Many people yes. asking you, are you going to bring the Arabic, the English teaching uh, back into universities or do you see Arabic is not the problem here, what we are facing? Well, let me just uh, go back to what uh, you have mentioned. Uh, thank you very much for mentioning that we need, we need really to focus in Arabic as well as beside the English language. Yeah. We would like uh, many of the universities to get back to teach in English some of some of the courses at least to start with 25% and then they can increase it. But the main problem is that what is that English teaching level at the primary and secondary school? We are getting, of course, the cream of the cream for the universities. We know about that. But what about the level of teaching the language itself, whether it is English or French or other language? So what if we want to get a real good English and Arabic education at that university level, we need really to improve the situation in the primary and elementary schools. This is important. Thing. Now, how, if we want to support teaching English at this time, not to wait for the primary schools and or improvement in secondary school, then we need to have English and Arabic language, both of them. They are declining, both of them, by the way. 
I, I, this is what I mentioned. Yes, they have stopped teaching in English, uh, the, the, the previous regime, and they uh, started teaching in Arabic. And uh, what happened is that the deterioration was in, in both languages, Arabic and English it's, uh, itself. So well, the problem now is how can we manage in the universities to put at least some courses for students to be taught for them from the first year of higher education in the university up to their graduation. They need both Arabic and English, not only English, but to help them at this, at this moment and to help at least to, to make it as a quick uh, surgery for, for the situation, if I may say, we need really to have some courses in the university level to, for the students from the first year and up to their fifth or sixth year according to what, whatever they are studying. Otherwise, we have to wait for primary education to be improved because that is where we are in line. And this is where we are really uh, depending on for the improvement of the teaching in, in language. At the American University, by the way, have when I done my master in uh, Islamic art and architecture, the media, of course, of the teaching was English, but the prerequisites are two. Arabic, that is number one. Of course, I was exempted from Arabic uh, exam. And then we have to, to have either French or German. I have chosen French because I have been taught in the high school French language, so I have chosen French, and I managed to 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 save my life and get my degree from the American University in Cairo. Okay, Professor, I appreciate your both time, so I will give you the final question before I go to you. Have to conclude two final questions, Professor Intisar. Uh, uh, yes. You are in your office, you are the Minister of Higher Education. Everyone understands, not just in Sudan, the whole world understands the situation in Sudan. Uh, the transition, you are working in a very difficult period. I don't think anyone working in a difficult situation like this. But most importantly, the whole world it went to uh, a, a real, even our finance or our um, uh, secretary for finance here or our minister, he said, don't ask me about figure until I finish the COVID. Clearly, COVID is taking every money now. What is your top priority as a minister of higher education in Sudan? Whatever that it is, that's the first question. What is what are you number one when you come to your office in the morning? Your top top priority in Sudan, and secondly, what do you think? Give us just one or two, if you like. How do you see the future of higher education in the Middle East post COVID nineteen? Assuming by December, as the Prime Minister is in the UK said, we we will become we will live with this COVID as normal, like influenza. It will come every year. So let's assume by the end of December. We are going to live with COVID as a normal virus. What do you see the future in the Middle East for higher education? So the two bars, the first one, what is your top priority as a minister in Sudan? Okay. Secondly, how do you see the so future? The top, okay, the top priority, uh, of course, is the infrastructure. Infrastructure, the labs, the lecture rooms themselves, and the lodging, the students' lodging. That is, a, this is a priority. Okay. This is number one. Without having this, no scientific research, no uh, quality, no whatever accreditation, nothing, nothing would happen without really making the big change and the big reform in this. And this is why we started last year, despite the fact that we're having the COVID and we're having the floods and we're having all these diseases, despite that fact, we started actually helping some of the universities in Kurdufan and in Darfur and one of the universities in Northern Sudan, at least to, to finish some of the, the already established building, but they couldn't finish it because of lack of money. So we, we, I think the infrastructure is more important. That's why when they ask us that you are going to have 50 million of USD dollars for what is it going to do? Well, I said to the infrastructure and the infrastructure of the labs, the labs for medicine student, for nursery, for or medical student, uh, the different uh, the faculties, and also to the engineering and the architecture. This is really very serious, you know, when, when, when you face like a COVID and when you look at the infrastructure, when you look at the roads and when you look at the bridges, you feel that there is a problem concerning the education. And it's not the teachers who are teaching, it is the lack of the, 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 the practical, how they practice whatever they, are, they have been taught. So this is number one. If you just allow me, somebody, I read it in the, in the chats, somebody have been talking about um, how, how I want to, to, to allow the public universities to raise tuition fees. Yes. I, I read it uh, in the chats and uh, yes. whether this is going to, to create a sort of problems. I, I did say that we are going to uh, allow the, to, uh, I'm not asking the universities to, to raise the tuition fees, but 
we are talking about to, to, to support the, 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 the research. No, it's not for research. I was talking about this, these are three avenues they can choose. And actually I concentrated in number two. Number one was allow the public university to raise tuition fees, but number two, to encourage them to diversify their sources of income. And this is what I said that I would like to stress on this because I believe this is the most important, it is the future. You cannot keep on raising the, 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 the tuition fees, especially for the public universities, because these are the public universities that is made for the middle class and for the poor people. You, are, well, you cannot do it, especially after, especially after. I think clearly the infrastructure is a major issue you can see now. Uh, Professor, I think you, we, you are freezing. Uh, Professor Abrahman, uh, just final question, the same for you. Yes. And uh, so um, what we need is really is the infrastructure. So if the infrastructure is okay for, for every one of these universities, as you know, uh, we cannot just close a college or a university in any region because this would help the people. We are having some social issues in the different parts of the country. So we have to help them to, 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 to reform the, the situation and, and to rehabilitate whatever they have and to build whatever we can do. That we are having many resources. I think she's, uh, the, the internet is freezing. Professor Abdurrahman, if I ask you, uh, I know you said earlier, you do not speak uh, for the government of Egypt, but uh, you are a leading academic in the Middle East, in Egypt itself. Uh, what do you think the priority? Egypt is a big country in the whole region. It's a very influential country. One of the oldest universities, the last Saharid in Egypt. What do you think the top priority for higher education in Egypt from your position as the provost? Not, I know you don't, you don't talk on behalf of the government. And secondly, how do you see the future of higher education in the Middle East in general, both COVID-19? So I think, um, uh, first of all, I think the, the biggest problem in, uh, that's facing higher education in Egypt is uh, the same as uh, Dr. Insar has mentioned, is infrastructure. That's uh, very important. Uh, that's one. Uh, uh, two, I think also that... Uh, um, um, uh, availability of uh, slots for higher education in the country is a problem and the uh, current government has started to work on that. We have seen unprecedented number of new universities in the country in the last couple of years and there is a plan to actually move into that direction for the coming years as well which is I think the solution is there. What we need to look is what we need to understand in Egypt is a university is not only walls and bricks, it also need the human resources to run it. So do we have the human resources to run those new universities or not? That's a question for the government to answer. What will be the higher education in our region after COVID-19? Mainly, uh, many of our students will look at online learning and international university as an alternative to our own universities in the region. And they will consider uh, going into uh, those online programs and we need to be prepared for that. That means that we're gonna lose many of our students to international universities who can offer qu high quality online programs. And uh, that means that we have to move fast in that domain as well and to offer online programs to uh, future students, and uh, that's going to change the shape of higher education in uh, in, in our region. Uh, in, in short, the competition, the international competition, will, is now at our doorsteps. Okay, thank you very very much, Professor Abdurrahman, the provost of the American University in uh, Cairo. I'm very, very sure we will continue the conversation. We are very, I really like you mentioned one of your aim is to have to expand international network and collaboration. Many universities will be delighted. We are very keen to collaborate with you. We will carry on and I'm sure Dr. Mohammed Hassan, we are grateful for making the connection with your office and the people in the American University. We will carry on, but we are very grateful. Thank you very, very much for your time. I appreciate it. You gave us a very valuable one and a half hour. I know how much 
this is important for a vice chancellor. Thank you very much. I just uh, thank you also, Professor Intisar. I know she tried her best with the internet. Uh, I think with Professor Intisar, we need to organize uh, a half an hour whenever she is free because um, there's many, Professor Intisar, if you just want to say a, a final word, but what I was proposing, uh, there's so many questions. I believe they are more of local nature. If uh, we can find any half hour and solve the internet, because I think there are more to do with the Sudanese issues, not the Middle Eastern one. But I, I will give you the final word, Professor, before we close the session. You have the final word, Professor. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Yes, I uh, will try my best to find, uh, uh, yes, a half an hour that you mentioned, and we are ready to, 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 to chat and to uh, talk with uh, our Sudanese fellows for any questions concerning higher education. And uh, I would like just to add that, yeah, yes, we'd, we'd also like to, to at least to reform uh, whatever we're having concerning the uh, digital uh, things and, and, and the online teaching. We, we are really uh, appreciate that the Ministry of Higher Education has already established its platform and we are looking forward to, to continue on this and to enhance it and to improve it for better education in the Sudan. If we ever are uh, faced with any other of these uh, uh, endemics, and um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. And I do apologize for all those who have, uh, I can see that I'm already being criticized, not also asking a question, but people need to appreciate. We have so many questions. We will definitely do our best. Again, we will have to appreciate the time of everyone. Thank you to everyone joining us. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Mohammed Hassan. He have worked very hard on also making this connection. The Pleasure Memory Podcast. If we all help and do a little bit, it will make a big difference.